Hello. Hi, Dr. Barrett. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> I I'm think ready. we're just waiting for Gina to get you equipped with a little telephone icon, and as soon as we have that, then she yeah. will say, go ahead. Amazing. We practice everything, and then something happens. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Perfect. I think, I think we'll, in the, uh, looking at the time, I think we'll get started. I think, uh, Dr. <sighs> Barrett, we have your phone line open, um, sure. and I'll try to mute everybody else. We'll try to keep the background noise. At okay. the minimum. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much then, Gina. And hello, everyone. Good morning to everybody uh, west of Thunder Bay and uh, good afternoon to the east. Thank you so much for joining us for this important webinar on maternal morbidity and mortality surveillance in Canada, where we are and where we are not. My name is Christopher Thrall. I'm the Communications Officer with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and I will be your MC for the webinar. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our webinar's technical host, CPSI Project Coordinator Gina Peck, and on behalf of Carla Williams, the lead for our Deteriorating Patient Condition Project. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the safety on the web page for deteriorating patient condition. If you run into IT difficulties or if you have any questions for any of our speakers today, please connect with us in the chat box and we would be happy to assist. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the first of our guests for today's webinar. Joanna Noble is the Supervisor of Knowledge Transfer, Healthcare Risk Management at Healthcare Insurance Reciprocal of Canada. Joanna? I think your microphone is muted, so you might just want to join us that way. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Joanna. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You um, so at HEROC, we're guided by our vision, which is partnering to create the safest healthcare system. And this includes our ongoing partnerships with our friends, such as CPSI and Patients for Patient Safety Canada. To set the context for today's presentation, I have to go back a couple of years. So looking at our medical legal claims experience from HEROC, the failure to appreciate or to respond to patient status was identified as HEROC's top-ranked risk. And this really crossed various healthcare settings and programs. So this includes in, in programs such as home care, community health, mental health, long-term care, chronic care, obstetrics, and other acute care settings. So this collaborative really looked at uh, curating the literature that's out there on patient deterioration and to work with our patient and family partners to study and co-create and disseminate tools um, specifically related to patient deterioration. And one of the guiding principles of this collaboration was that all initiatives and projects and tools were to be co-led and co-created with patients and families such as Sabine Robbins. So other work that we are currently undergoing uh, looks at evaluating tools and resources for age and population specific um, resources for the different um, healthcare settings. Um, and as we'll see at the end of the session, the tools that we have identified or co-created or, or uh, disseminated will all appear on the CPSI website. So I have the pleasure of introducing our, our speaker, Dr. John Barrett. I won't read his entire bio, but to give you some highlights, he is the Chief of Maternal Fetal Medicine at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and a Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toronto. He is also the Founder and Chair of the Southern Ontario Obstetrical Network, also known as SOON, and he has held over more than $20 million in grants. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Barrett. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Joanna, and uh, to the Canadian Patient Safety Institute for giving um, me the forum really on behalf of the, um, well, two, two ways. One is personal. I've been in the space for a while, maternal morbidity and mortality, and but more recently um, with an increasing uh, link with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. And so what I'm, what I'm going to do today is give you a little bit of background, background I think. I'm going to try and int into this topic in Canada and then update you um, as to what, um, what, what is happening on, an, on, a, national, uh, on a national level um, in this area. Um, um, 
um, I'm talking on a webinar with a presentation. It's, it's, uh, it's a strange way to do it. I've not done this before because normally you look into your audience and you can see whether you have them or have not, and I've got no way of knowing that now. So if um, I, I guess if, uh, if if something goes wrong, someone will tell me, and I'll just carry on and speak as if you're all listening and interested. And thank you for joining us during this lunch break. So um, maternal morbidity and, and um, mortality in Canada is something that um, I think it, 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 uh, it's an important topic to everybody, especially here at High Rock and the Canadian Patient uh, and Safety Institute. Now, how do I change my next slide? I know how we did it in the practice. How did that work, um, Gina? How do I change yeah, the okay, next Yeah, okay, Dr. Barrett, if you just go over to the left-hand side of your screen yeah. and click, you'll see the number 04 there and an arrow below it. Okay, got it. Fine. Okay, guys, bear with me. To... Thank you. Yep, there, there you go. Um, and so for, for this talk, because it's important, I'm going to, um, as I said, give you a, um, um, an um, idea of the uh, summary of the SOGC initiatives uh, into maternal mortality. Um, for disclosures, um, I have uh, in the past received financial support, but uh, nothing for those financial support is going to influence what I'm, I'm, I'm going to say now. Um, and, and so if we look at maternal mortality, the, the reason I think everybody became more interested in it was with the WHO, I was so I am a maternal, uh, a maternal health advisor to the WHO, and and we all heard about the Millennium D Development Goals about reducing maternal mortality, um, and um, it was recognised by the world that maternal mortality is one of the main indicators of a country's health, and so the MDGs were were set to to acknowledge this um, and to try and. Uh, um, 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 have initiatives to reduce these mortality to certain goals um, um, ar across the world. So the, 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 the term that we use for maternal mortality is the maternal mortality ratio, which is the pregnancy-related death per 100,000 births, and that's the index which the WHO. Um, and um, the definition of that uh, maternal death is the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of the termination of the pregnancy irrespective of the duration and site of the pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, but not from accidental or incidental causes. So that was the, the definition um, which everybody used for the MDGs. Uh, and it was, it, when these were published, it was, it was quite sobering that um, the um, maternal mortality ratio in, uh, in Canada was in fact not decreasing, in fact probably increasing a little bit as it was in the United States. Um, over the years, and that caused some concern. And some of the concern um, was um, was focused because of the correction factor which the WHO applied to our data. In other words, they didn't believe our data that we had, and so they corrected it by a factor of, of uh, almost double. Um, and together with that, I think it cost focused on the recognition that um, perhaps you know, in the in the society that we have in Canada, this wonderful f uh, first first world country with all the resources, um, there was something happening um, with our mothers, um, and it's becoming recently very much in the press. Everyone has been aware of the maternal mortality and mortality in the United States, which is also actually not staying the same. <coughs> excuse me. But but actually increasing as well. Um, so as as I mentioned. The, for me and for many of us at the SOGC and in the in the space of maternal health, it was a sobering wake-up call because this is an old paper, um, Maternal Mortality and Severe Maternal Mortality Surveillance in Canada. So this was a working group that I helped coordinate almost 10 years ago. And um, uh, I'm not sure who's on this call, but anybody who's sort of in the space of uh, obstetrics and gynecology will recognize the names of the people there, people who've been leaders in obstetrics and gynecology. It was with the SOGC. GC. And basically, we, 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 had all, we held a consensus and, uh, um, with multiple uh, stakeholders. And the call at that time, and this was uh, more than 10 years ago, um, was to, to, to develop a firstly reliable data mechanism collection system. Um, and secondly, more important, to recognize that if we're going to change uh, or impact maternal mortality and morbidity, that collection, that data isn't really going to do it. You really have to have a, some under the idea of the, um, of the social impact or the social 
um, environment with which that death occurred, um, as well as the preventable factors. So um, I think a full disclosure, um, you can hear from my accent, I'm South African originally, and I'm trained in the UK. And, and when I was training in the UK, the things that um, obstetricians or all caregivers, midwives, nurses and obstetrics, and, I, and I'm sure patients um, sort of rely on is something called the Confidential Inquiry into Maternal Mortality. It's a triennial publication. Every three years they publish um, uh, a report on a confidential inquiry on all the maternal deaths which they successfully capture um, um, by a, uh, a mechanism that they've set up. And the amount of information and preventable factors and knowledge that was gleaned from this um, inqu inquiry was uh, significant to anybody caring for women and for, for women in childbirth. And one of the goals that, one of the things when I came to Canada to, to live and to practice, it amazed me that a country as rich as ours, as connected as ours, and as relatively small, didn't have this facility. And, and one of the calls we made at that right uh, initial stage was to get better data and um, and to, to, to see if we can get a confidential inquiry. And I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say that, that nothing really changed since then. And I'm, I guess, pleased to say that things are changing now. And that's what I'm going to, to tell you about and to see what's happening. So the problem with maternal mortality is data sources. If you look at the confidential inquiry uh, uh, in the UK, which I guess is the model for what we know with their confidential inquiry, which captures every single death, that the vital statistics or the vital registration systems only capture approximately half of all the maternal deaths. There's a, a publication by, by Marion Knight, which we can circulate afterwards, um, by Marion Knight. Uh, it, was, it was published in 2014, and they compared the number of deaths that were captured by a confidential inquiry reporting system with the vital statistics data, and then they showed that only about half of the deaths on vital statistics are captured by um, by, uh, by the vital statistics mechanism, and that's the, um, uh, it's, it's probably why there's a correcting factor um, with us um, uh, by the WHO. Canada doesn't have a national inquiry process. We've got no set targets, and um, we have a we have a system in Canada where we have healthcare and responsibility in provinces, um, uh, and yet we have a federal system, and sometimes uh, there is a, there's a, a gap between the ability for us to share data at a Canadian level when this data is in fact in the provinces and has difficulty in, in, um, in leaving the provinces. So uh, the provinces and territories are leaders, um, and some of them do have existing processes, but there's never been a capitalization or a synergy between these processes and the way to do it on a national level. So um, I'm really grateful uh, that um, people at the uh, SOGC has maintained interest in this, and especially want to give credit to um, the scientific advisor of the SOGC, um, Jocelyn Cook, who um, you know, together with other people um, realize the importance of what we're doing um, and um, decided to, to have another go at getting this right again. And, and what you're seeing now is I think the, uh, the, the, is the emphasis of this since about 2010. So we, we had a, a working group to, to look at this issue again. A committee was formed for maternal mortality. And, and, and then we started realizing, well, we knew it all along, but um, Mortality is the tip of our iceberg, and really maternal morbidity or severe morbidity, which is the precursor to many mortalities. A wonderful paper by Joel Ray in the, in the I think it was Canadian Medical Association Journal, showed the association between morbidity and mortality. Um, and, and we started investigating, and we realized there were significant barriers to data access, to the coverage of all the places in Canada, um, and completeness of data. And there's also been... Uh, you know, no, no surprising, the demographics have shifted. Our population is becoming older. Um, maternal age is a powerful co um, contributor of, of maternal morbidity and mortality, um, and, uh, and cesarean section rates are increased. Hemorrhage rates are increasing with the um, invasive placentation. So the landscape of cha is changing at the same time as why we, it was essential to, to try and get a better handle of what was, was happening. So this is a, a slide for me, which is just on my wall in my office. If you if you don't succeed, then you shouldn't be uh, first time, and then skydiving is not for you. So in our field, we haven't got the we haven't got the 
uh, we can't say we give up and we're not going to do it because our patients' lives depend on it, so we have to do it. So in 2016, um, Jocelyn was successful in getting some funding um, to get experts together, and we decided don't, not to reinvent the wheel but to ask our colleagues in the United Kingdom, and Marion came over, and we brought stakeholders from everywhere, from um, across Canada, um, patient stakeholders, uh, tried to get representation from all populations of across Canada, and we had a workshop which we reviewed the data sources. We created a list of key indicators of morbidity. So we now know what we all agree when we're talking about what severe mor morbidity is. We looked at, uh, and, and, and we brought... Uh, um, and, uh, all the stakeholders to try and find out exactly where the gaps in our processes were. And this was published uh, by Jocelyn, the first author, and you can see Marion Knight there about measuring maternal morbidity and mortality. And it gave a Canadian context of up-to-date um, um, mechanisms that we have and finding the gaps of where we are in this path to, um, um, to do this. We had another meeting in 2017, and um, we... Uh, integrated, we connected with other health organizations, other professional societies, and then in 2018 um, had a workshop, and and that was just recently completed, uh, completed, and um, we had a two-day workshop. We had key Canadian experts, and resolved at the stage that there's two um, two two things that we agree. The first is that while vital statistics and data is important, and we need to um, uh, make every effort to have complete data, that really the strategy that we need to do is to try and get the maternal con the confidential inquiry set up by using the facilities that are present in each particular province um, and mimicking the confidential inquiry process within each province and then centralizing that on a, on a national basis, not necessarily by sharing the data, but by sharing the lessons um, to do that with the ultimate goal of finding the places within these deaths um, that are uh, that are preventable. So it was decided that we we needed a national consortium of maternal mortality, that we are going to do a provincial system of a confidential inquiry system, and uh, we're currently working on mechanisms of how to do that, whether it's by mimicking the UK system of chart audit, or whether it's going to be by the currently existing provincial data um, um, system um, um, systems that there are in place. So Obviously, it's going to take some money, but it became clear during this workshop that there are currently preventable systems that audit maternal morbidity and mortality. The trouble is there's no centralization of these systems, and there's no audit mechanism in place, which we think we can, uh, we're going to do. So um, we are currently working on a national online database so that we're going to be collecting constant data in each province with a minimum data set for, for the data, and we've taken data, uh, the same data forms that they use in the UK and also um, from the US to develop a Canadian specific Canadian flavor database. So at least there'll be consistent data in each uh, province, um, provinces. And then a, a mechanism of a confidential um, look at this data with an in-depth dive in the cases so we can start doing a provincial-based confidential inquiry system, which will then be synthesized at a national level. So uh, currently, that's where we are. Um, um, it's gone. One of the biggest um, impediments, potential impediments, has been the legal impediment. When you start doing confidential inquiries, um, we have to know that the inquiries um, and the deliberations are protected. Um, they are in the UK by statute. Um, we think we've got the mechanism to doing it, and we're currently talking to our partners of HIROC and the CMPA to get permission to do that. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm pleased to tell you really that many of the provinces, Ontario, um, Nova Scotia, BC in particular, have got really quite robust mechanisms of um, identifying morbidity and mortality data. They've got the people and the places that currently go into hospitals to review these adverse events when they happen. And so um, I think it's not too optimistic to say that within a year or two, we will at least have a trial of some kind kind of confidentially in, uh, inquiry-based system in each province. And the challenge in then is going to be um, to, to, have a, uh, to link those um, in, some, in, in some national organization uh, of which the SOGC is keen to play a part. So I think, I think I'll stop there if, uh, if, if giving, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions or, or comments from anybody.
Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Barrett. Uh, we're just going to hold questions until the end. We are, we are getting a couple privately through the chat box, and I do invite all of our attendees to please submit their questions for Dr. Barrett and for Joanna Noble through the chat box, and we'll address them in the question and answer period at the end. However, I do want to thank you very much for those insights, Dr. Barrett, a great overview of the, of the project as a, as a whole. Um, and please remember that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the CPSI website probably within the next week. However, now I would like to pass it back to Joanna Noble from HIROC to demo the available web resources. Joanna? Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm going to show um, how I access some of the tools and resources on the CPSI website. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here with you. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so you should see in front of you the CPSI uh, website. So this is a screenshot of the home page for the CPSI. So as I mentioned earlier, we have worked with our, our various partners to co-create and um, upload tools and resources related to the recognition of clinical deterioration. So in terms of how you can access these tools and resources within, within the uh, CPSI, so I, uh, website, uh, what I do is that I type in deteriorating patient condition, but you can also type in DPC into the search file, and um, it should uh, take you into the actual tools and resources, but there's multiple ways of getting it, but I'll just show you what I do. So I just typed it in, it's going to do a search, and what you can see is that there's multiple filter options. So I, I might have mentioned this earlier that when we were developing and co-creating and curating the tools and resources, it was really for three different audiences. So the first one was for the public, the second one was for provider, and the, and the third one was for leaders. So I'm just going to go into the, the main uh, website page. And you can see, once again, you see for the public, the provider, provider, and the leader. So you can click on any of these icons, and it will take you into the tools. So you can also see that on the right-hand side, so there's multiple ways of accessing the tools and resources. So one of the resources, just to point out, is a, is a video. I won't play it for you, but you can play that um, from your computer, and it's a, it's a video talking about uh, what is a burning platform when it comes to a deteriorating patient condition. And there's also the story of little Matea, um, and there's a video as well, so I do encourage you to go on and take a look at that. So I'm going to click on the public first to see the type of tools and resources that are available, and the similar layout is available for the other uh, audiences, such as the provider and the leader. So once again, you see the video here, um, and then there's a link to some of the tools and resources. So this is one of the first tools and resources that I believe that was uploaded. Um, and this was uh, the top 10 warning signs of a rapidly declining patient. So I think this is one of the, uh, the hottest uh, downloads off the CPSI website related to uh, clinical deterioration. So if you hadn't, haven't had an opportunity to take a look at that, I encourage you to do so. But then it breaks it down by different categories, such as newborn jaundice, um, sepsis, um, and it provides some links and tools, uh, links to resources that are available on other websites as well. So at any time, you can switch over to see the content for providers or leaders, which I'm going to do right now. And once again, it's a similar look and feel, um, but the, the tools and resources have been really um, categorized based on the, the type of audience. But it's pretty easy to navigate. You can see that we've got tools for obstetrics, so the general care uh, setting, pediatric setting. So I'm just going to click on the obstetrical setting. So what it has done, it's listed, again, some resources uh, for patients, and it links you to other tools and resources that are out there as well. So I think I'm going to end it there and hand it back over. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Joanna. And I'm sure that we will have some questions coming out from the attendees about the uh, web resources that we've provided through there. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Dr. Barrett. And now we can start going up into questions. I remind you to please enter your questions into the chat box on the right-hand side. And we'll start up a conversation with our two august speakers here. Ooh, you're august now. <laughs> so 
Thank you both very, very much for joining. Uh, we did have one from the floor. Is there any insight into why Canada's maternal uh, morbidity and mortality numbers are so high in comparison to other developed countries? Uh, just a guess, are we just better at tracking? Uh, do you have any opinions on that, Dr. Barron? So that's a, that's a great question, um, and I don't know all the answers, and that's one of the one of the exact reasons we have to start um, looking at one uh, start looking at this in in exact detail. I think I have a couple of ideas. The one is, although we are a developed country, we have subpopulations um, of significant risk of morbidity and mortality um, within embedded in our populations. Our, our, our First Nation population. Um, has a significant higher risk of um, the patients are a significant higher risk for maternal morbidity, preterm birth, and the associated morbidities and mortalities, and some of it's geographic, and some of there, there are many multifold reasons within that. Um, and and so I think although developed, we have populations of much higher risk. Uh, embedded in that as well, we have um, we ha paradoxically we have um, sort of I would say the other population group. Um, which uh, are urban-based um, and are having children at a much higher age, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a significant risk factor um, for maternal morbidity and mortality. Now, that's true in other countries as well, um, but exactly why we are not doing as well compared to you know, other demographics, um, it might be our data is better than others. It, there might be something more unique. Um, and the trouble with our system at the moment um, is we don't know why. Um, um, which is and and we're never going to know why with data and and that's why I think I think we were on the wrong path so many years ago when we started it. We try to get there by getting data because we knew our data was incompletely ascertained, and that annoys people when you haven't got good data. What we're more focusing on now is the data that we've got to have a deeper dive so we can look into the reasons and the preventable factors and the subtleties behind why. Um, why women uh, in in this day and age get uh, uh, get uh, get you know have morbid events or die? I know um, one of the major things that is increasing in Canada is postpartum hemorrhage, um, which is a major cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, and I and we know that postpartum hemorrhage is uh, there's a condition. Um, called placenta accreta, which is when the placenta is abnormally attached. The incidence now is one in 500. It used to be one in many thousands, which is associated directly with our rate of cesarean sections. And that's why one of our most important safety initiatives to prevent morbidity is the prevention of the first cesarean section, um, um, because there is a, a, a direct link between the number of cesarean sections and the risk of the morbidly adherent placenta. So if you have a recipe of maternal age and number of cesarean sections, you have an increasing rate. But the, your question is a good one. Why, that's, is that the same everywhere else? It probably is. We're not unique in that. So uh, the answer is I don't know, and that's one of the reasons we need to start this kind of inquiry to get deeper dives into the underlying reasons behind these morbid and, 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 and death, uh, morbid events and, and, and cases of mortality. Absolutely. Absolutely. We just basically need more data again. So um, I did have another question that came in. Uh, Adam asks, how do you balance the need for information gathering and the risk of stoking fear in these at-risk populations? Hmm. Um, Janet, do you want to do you want to take that? Or? Yeah, I thought that might <laughs> be Joanna's question. question there. Joanna, are you still with us? I am. So the oh, question really is: Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. So the the, the question was. Uh, can you repeat the question back again, just to make sure that I understand? Absolutely. How do you balance the need for information for this data that uh, Dr. Barrett said was so important, that information gathering versus the risks of stoking fears in the at-risk populations that you're collecting data from? Mm, that's, that's a good one. I, I, that's, I, I really couldn't say. I mean, I think our, our first, we're talking about the clients, the women, I mean, I think, is that what our concern is in terms of installing fear into them in terms of talking about some of the risks associated with? Or is this more about the data collection from organizations? Oh, it seems to be more about the individual that you're, you're grilling these questions with just in order to extract the maximum amount of data, I'm, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Dr. Barrett? Mm. So, personally, I don't think data 
um, data itself um, shouldn't instill fear. I mean, if you look at that, our overall rate, the, um, I think everyone has to put this in perspective, the, the maternal mortality rate in, in, in Canada is very low. It's about 8 per 100,000, so it's very, very low. Um, that's not to say we have to be complacent for all the reasons I've said. So um, I don't think data itself um, instills fear as long as it's in context. And again, I would repeat myself. Um, the, the, the point of, of data is to is to find the preventable factors so that we can improve patient safety. I think if things are are, are are put in that perspective, I don't think that will make people fearful. I think it will make people uh, feel safer if they knew that there was a surveillance system in place to address the um, uh, the safety of our system, um, and which is why I think maternal mortality is, you know, is way too late. And fortunately, we, it's a very rare event in Canada um, these days. Maternal morbidity, that is where we actually need to go because that's where we can act to prevent the deaths before they happen by looking at the lessons from our maternal morbid events. And I think most of the public, if they knew that you know what um, everyone realizes that things happen in 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 the medical field, but I think people would would prefer there to be a system, a rigorous system of audit and inquiry to investigate when things happen rather than 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 the opposite. So I think if it's framed in that way, I, I think I mean, I'd like to hear from patients how they, or, or, or the public how they feel about that. But as a medical profession, I'd rather have a system that are of audit and, um, and and inquiry rather than the opposite. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Barrett. I do think that focus grouping the questions and making sure that they are as respectful as possible makes a lot of sense in that kind of situation. Mm. And that's why I think it's really important, though, and I know in our working groups, we always have um, the public or patient in various, uh, 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 the patient's perspective. Um, it, uh, I know the, the institution I'm at, Sunnybrook, is, um, is, is very, very strong on having um, the public involved in every inquiry that we do, whether it's patient safety, whether it's research, where it's, you know, where it's how's the, how's the, the waiting room designed. So we have to, we have to care. So sometimes as, you know, as professionals, we can lose that perspective. So that's why Adam's question is a really important one to, to always have in mind. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I had a uh, fo sort of a follow-up question from Paul. He's quite excited. The, the initiative is great and clearly timely and overdue. Um, how can we, as practitioners and local leaders, help move this initiative forward? Hmm. That's, gonna, that's a really question. I, I don't, um, I'll tell you what it's going to take. Um, it, it's going to take a willingness of um, hospitals because um, many deaths don't occur or morbid events happen in hospitals, but many do. And, and that's going to be our first task. It's going to take a willingness of caregivers to be able to um, um, be, how can I put it, be transparent um, in this audit. So, um, for example, um, in our network, in our Southern Ontario Obstetric Network, which is a network of 18 hospitals in Southern Ontario, um, we've already got an agreement from the chiefs of the hospitals that if there was a morbid event, they would allow um, this kind of audit or external inspection of the event um, in order to learn from it. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take a willingness. It's going to, I think patients should ask for it. I think our, uh, practitioners should be open and willing to give it. Um, and obviously, it's got to be balanced. We, we live in a, in a climate of, unfortunately, um, medical legal interrogation. And, and, and so the balance between protecting, um, protecting us uh, as professionals, and the balance for being willing to, willingness to open inspection is what we what we need and what we open to. And this question right now is 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 in front of the uh, of the uh, CMPA, the Medical Protection Department, and, and I'm sure of HIROC. They they did it in the UK. They did it in the UK by having a national act that's saying that the data that is in that is embedded in this inquiry is protected. We have such mechanisms in Canada. It's called QSIPA arrangement. Um, we need to make sure that we can both protect and inquire at the same time. And I think you asked what we can do. I think the public should demand it. The public should respect the process, and physicians um, should be willing to um, to participate in it. 
Perfect. Thank you. Joanna, did you have anything to add about that in terms of moving this initiative forward? No, I, I think um, what Dr. Barrett has said, it, it does make a, a lot of sense. Uh, and I think it really is a, a balance in terms of when you are collecting data because there's a lot of considerations um, related to the, the actual collection, um, but also in terms of some of the, as uh, Dr. Barrett mentioned, some of the medical legal issues, and I think that needs to be worked out. So, no, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Joanna. Adam actually had a follow-up question that showed up in our Q&A box over there. Um, is there a risk that the data collection that we will be doing will discover limitations in current practice that could expose practitioners to malpractice litigation? Hmm. What do you think about that? Um, so I, I mean, I guess I'll take that. Um, there is a, whenever you do an audit of practice, um, there is um, a risk that, or a, 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 a chance that you will find practice that is below the standard of care. Um, um, we can't, however, be, and, and that is why um, the method of inquiry is anonymous, so that um, people can feel that they can be transparent without being without being scared. So there is that possibility. Um, the biggest, uh, and, but, but we, I don't think we can let the fear of that inhibit us learning of, of the far bigger issue. And the far bigger issue is not that people have been uh, practicing below the standard. It's just that the system um, within that standard is not designed is not designed perfectly. So rather than having a culture of fear and defensiveness, we need to have a culture of openness and transparency at the same time protecting people because uh, the reality is uh, people need to be protected and the information needs to be. There is that data. This is some new stuff. Um, you know, the, the College of Physicians of Ontario have a, have, a, have a policy of open transparency when errors are made. We are, we are not scared to tell patients anymore that errors have been made, and we, need, and we shouldn't be. It's there. This, this needs to be done. Um, and that's, I'm sure part of the Patient Safety Institute's mandate is encouraging that kind of process. Um, Absolutely, you're 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 singing our song right now, Doctor. Exactly. So 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 we're not we we shouldn't be scared of 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 interrogating a process because we're scared of finding the errors, because the problem in the majority of cases are not substandard care and errors. It's a system process, and and we can learn from the you know from the from the from the airline industry. Now there's a critical event in the air, airline industry. Nobody. Yeah freezes and doesn't analyze the crash because they're worried that they're going to find pilot negligence. On the opposite, they interrogate the crash and then, you know, everybody who's flown these days will, will hear a new, a new announcement. Um, you know, when you land, the nearest exit might be behind you. Have you have anyone heard that? I mean, I was flying recently and I never, I never heard that three years ago and I, I sort of made an inquiry. Where did that come from? And it came from a car, a, a plane accident where they realized that people didn't realize that the exit was behind them. And so people lost their lives trying to get through an exit that was too far away from him. A simple, a simple fact that people got from inquiry into a bad event. And we have to, we have to do the same thing so that we can, we can flag the exact features which, which were just flagged for you, the, the deteriorating patient. These aren't negligent things or things that people have missed the standard of care. These are real events which we can help people um, and help patients to prevent morbidity. So, um, so I, I, think, I, I think that's my response to that question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Joanna, did you have anything to add for, um, I guess, malpractice litigation concerns? Yeah, so these cases, when they are reported to us, they're, they're, very, they're reported infrequently to us. Um, but I think Dr. Barrett brought up a really good point because um, we, we ensure the, the health system. So I think what's kind of neat from our data is that we get to see some of the common contributing factors from the system level as well as the practitioner. So, um, you know, a perfect example is, you know, timely access to blood products. Um, you know, the postpartum hemorrhage may not be expected, and then there's a sudden urgent need to um, access Access blood products. There's so many moving steps uh, to actually access the blood products, and you could say, well, you know, that was a practitioner's fault, but it's not. It really is a system issue. So that's a really uh, big takeaway: is that there's so many moving parts, and in, and there really is a lot of um, um, system level level issues that really do contribute to some of these um, some of the preventable maternal mortality and morbidity claims. For sure. Thank you so much, Deb. All right, another question has come out. Um, 
Uh, we we uh, CPSI works with uh, a number of different institutions on some incident reporting systems such as hospital harm, etc. Has there been any cons consideration for developing an incident re reporting system similar to, say, ISMP, uh, to both assist with data collection as well as to increase detection and awareness, and basically enhance the potential learning from these events? Has there been any work that's actually gone into a reporting system, Dr. Barrett? I don't know. Um, um, so I know that. So I don't know if there's been a, syst a sort of a systematic or a comprehensive reporting system done. I know there are quality-based dashboards which are in place across the hospitals. But um, are they? Are they? Um, is there a, a sort of a system that's in place that's developed a, a warning system like that? Um, I don't know of that. Maybe Joanna. Maybe you know if there's been I, one. I think it was reporting system, not a warning system. A reporting system. So no, no, I don't. I don't think there is one. Um, um, it, it, uh, we have the data to do that. I mean, especially in Ontario, with our born data system, we have um, we have the ability to report and to collect um, data on on many of our births. Um, but I don't know of any any warning, any any system that uh, a reporting system that's there on a provincial basis or or even a, in our network basis. We haven't got. Would be a good idea though. Yeah. No, I, I'm not aware of one either. Gotcha. Uh, usually it's a matter of setting what the standards are and being able to exactly define what you are reporting. And then it's a, usually a matter of voluntary re voluntary re reporting from different uh, agencies, et cetera. So we, we've been trying to work towards that. And if there isn't one or isn't any work uh, done on it yet, then maybe that's something to put on the menu. Mm. So. That would be interesting. Absolutely. Um, Another question came through, has the committee explored the opportunities for further research, direct and indirect evidence, consequences and outcomes for families as a result of the data that has been collected? Uh, what, what, are ne what are next steps, I guess? Mm. Um, so uh, the, I'm not sure the next steps. Have we, have we thought of um, the data that we do, what are the next steps? I think, yes. I mean, the answer is um, there, there have been studies with data. Um, um, and, and they continue to 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 to, um, to evaluate. There are they're kind of specific projects. So there'll be a there'll be a data on the outcome um, of operative vaginal delivery. There'll be data on the outcome of specific quality projects on shoulder dystocia. Um, and so the next, I think where we are now is we have in many. I'm talking about say for example our network. We have good outcome data on things we want to avoid. Shoulder dystocia, cesarean section, hemorrhage, hysterectomy. Uh, I, I think we're at the next step of um, uh, two two phases. One is this uh, is a is a deeper dive to find out the underlying causative factors or what we call the root cause analysis of many of these events, as I've suggested. And then the second thing is specific intervention projects in a specific outcome. So one of the things which uh, calls to mind is uh, in our network we um, we we, uh, we we try to address the issue of. Um, or two things. One is postpartum hemorrhage and one is shoulder dystocia. So within our network, we had a shoulder dystocia sort of model going the circuits. People could practice um, overcoming simulations of shoulder dystocia without uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, to decrease the risk of brachial plexus injuries. And the other one was um, uh, Sunny Brooks has a, a simulation, postpartum simulation team, which uh, has been going around to the soon hospitals doing simulation of postpartum hemorrhages based on data which shows an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So, so you know, based on the data we have, I think it's time to to do two things. One is a general system inquiry, as we've said, by the confidential thing, because I don't think we have the full picture. And the second thing is targeted interventions in particularly adverse events that we can choose. Perfect. Thank you so much. I hope I answered I I answer that question properly. I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I'm not seeing any blowback from the chat box, so I'm assuming <laughs> that some, uh, somebody is satisfied with the answer. So, uh, We did have a question come out from Sandra. Are tools or gap analysis tools created for practitioners and administrators related to the subject and for data collection and how to disclose. I guess are the tools are avail uh, available created for uh, practitioners and administrators. And do we have disclosure gu guidelines for them? Hmm. I don't know of any. Joanna, do you know? 
Well, there are disclosure guidelines out there. Um, I think you can find that on the CPSI uh, website. But in, to, in terms of like pre-existing um, like safety bundles uh, mm. for clinicians, I think there are uh, some related to you know postpartum hemorrhage. Um, but in terms of the bigger picture related to uh, maternal mortality, morbidity, I'm not aware of them, but I think they're very specific. So there's, you know, again, safety bundles related to, right. you know, shoulder to social right. postpartum, but not one big overall one. Right. And, and then the question on, on, on gap analysis tools, I, I don't really know if there, if there has been a gap analysis into what's missing in respect to this particular areas of disclosures and stuff like that. There, there certainly are safety bundles that they're around, but I, I don't know if they're... Um, um, are there any specific ones like in, in this question? So just in terms of like here are tools and resources, so we, we extract learning from claims. So we are creating for the first time a risk reference sheet based on our claims experience, looking very specifically at postpartum hemorrhage. So I guess you can see that almost as one form of a, a gap analysis in terms of looking at both, you know, team practitioner, but also system level uh, contributing factors associated with postpartum hemorrhage. But that's just one that just came to mind. Right. Thank you. Thank you both very much for that. I hope Sandra is well satisfied with that answer. <laughs> that said, I have one more question that's pending here. So I do invite any attendees, if you have any follow-up questions, anything you'd like to ask, then I invite it. But uh, the last question that's uh, trickled through here is um, we, we define never events in hospitals in Canada. And there's the question that any thoughts on whether maternal death or serious harm associated with labor or delivery in low-risk pregnancy or deaths due to postpartum hemorrhage after elective cesarean sections should be considered never events for hospitals? Hmm. That's, a, that's a great question, it, and it was something that we addressed at our last, at our last um, uh, meeting with the SOGC. So um, it, an attempt has been made to, to address these sort of never events in culture at the NBC. They've, uh, they've addressed these, and they've, they've, circulated, they've set out a, a list of what they will call never events. Um, and um, I think, you know, a death after cesarean section um, for postpartum hemorrhage um, should be a never event. Uh, I agree, it, it, it should be, but I, I, I don't know if I want to be responsible in taking that decision by myself. There's, there's, uh, I, I'd have to look at what the never events list is that have been generated by people, um, say, in the, in the US. They've got, they, they're a little bit more advanced than us. They don't tend to use that in the UK. So I think, in principle, what your question is, is a correct one, um, that there are certain things which we should declare as never events. Does that mean they're never going to happen? I don't think that's, a, I don't think that's the same thing. But I think it's, it's what we're saying is that really in, in, in Canada, this kind of thing should never happen. And if it does happen, then there's a, there's a process issue or a person issue or something like that. So I think in principle, in principle I, I like the idea of never events. Uh, I'm just not comfortable knowing which which they should be, uh, or, or, or you know, <laughs> confirming yeah. that, yeah, that, that should be You one, don't know what might... the standards are to apply to that. Yeah, exactly. I'm not I'm comfortable on the spot saying, yeah, that, what you, the example you give, you just given, sounds like a good one to me, but I just <laughs> yeah. don't, I wouldn't want to be. never you know, happen. I agree. <laughs> this is recorded and it's going all over the place. And yeah, Dr. Barrett this should, said this should be in every event. So yeah. I don't, I don't, want to, I want to do that. But in principle, I think, yes, we should work together um, to, to, to delineate these never events because these focus the interventions. Yes, absolutely. Joanna, do you have any more insight on never events in hospitals? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a touchy point because I think, you know, when you think about what a never event is, it's never to take place. And we know that some of these events, you can try your best, um, but sometimes mm. uh, they're not preventable. But we know there are a lot of contributing factors. Um, so it, it's a bit of a, a touchy subject because I think in some jurisdictions outside of Canada, it is considered uh, a never event. So um, I will leave that to the clinicians to make that determination <laughs> in terms of whether it's a never event. Yeah, I think, right. I, I think as long as people realize that a never event doesn't mean it's never going to happen. What we say, what I understand in every event is that that um, if this event did happen, um, then something potentially went wrong in our system and our process. Right, significant um, consequences, uh, uh, and look at those processes and look exactly. how we make the improvement. Exactly, Absolutely. in other words, not accept the event as something that just happens. Because, you, you know, like a wound infection after surgery happens. 
It's not a never event. It's a complication of surgery. Death after something like that, I think after a cesarean section, elective or emergency, maybe should never happen. I don't know if it should never happen. It depends. Uh, but I think it, it, it just calls into question that we shouldn't accept it as, as oh, well, this is just one of those things. That's, yeah. that's what we have to get away from, I think just a cost of doing business. Yeah. Correct. And, and, and in that basis, if we understand, that's how I understand every event. And so, um, yeah, I would think that death after a cesarean section is not part of the routine way of doing business and therefore it would fit in my definition of an every event. But as, as Joanna says, it's a touchy subject. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to thank you both. Uh, we are out of questions, and I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Barrett, for sharing your time and your expertise. Thanks as well to Joanna Noble for introducing those essential resources and helping administer this call here. Uh, thanks, of course, to all of you for taking the time to attend. We know how busy your day is, and we appreciate you choosing to spend time with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Please visit our website for a recorded version of the presentation, which should be available within the next week. Remember that you, if you didn't get a question answered or if you do want to follow up, please email Gina Peck at gpeck at cpsi-icsp.ca and we will make sure that you get the information you need. So on behalf of Gina Peck and Carla Williams, thanks again to Dr. Barrett and to Joanna Noble and we invite you all to visit our website at patientsafetyinstitute.ca to find out more about these tools and the other important sa patient safety initiatives hosted by CPSI. So have a wonderful day everyone and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.